Archie Leach from Bristol, England, by the sea, like me. Devastatingly handsome, and he doesn't know if he's Arthur or Martha. And each time I look at him, neither do I. Hollywood at the time when the golden age of cinema was happening was probably the most homophobic city in not just America, but the world. Darling, that's me? Mm-hmm. You have a date, my beloved, July the 1st at 5 o'clock. Almost 10 decades ago, the charismatic Cary Grant, destined for screen stardom, allegedly cohabitated in a scandalous Greenwich Village love nest with none other than an Australian gent who would later clinch three coveted Oscars. He breaks hearts all over town, but he still comes home to me. These jaw-dropping revelations were unearthed in the tantalizing documentary, Women He's Undressed, which hit DVD and video on demand in 2016, injecting a hefty dose of spice into the age-old rumors swirling around Grant's romantic proclivities. The film shed light on the life of celebrated costume designer Ori Kelly, whose unveiled memoir, Women I've Undressed, contributed juicy tidbits to the saga of Grant's mysterious sexuality in a world where being gay was almost considered a sin. Grant, a young and determined performer who came to the United States with dreams of making it big in showbiz, found himself entwined in a controversial love story in the heart of Greenwich Village. This secret affair, hidden from the public eye for many years, was brought into the spotlight in 2016, shaking up the carefully crafted image of Grant as the perfect leading man. The documentary that surfaced during this revelation turned out to be a gold mine of shocking information. Alongside this, Kelly's explosive memoir contributed to painting a vivid picture of Grant's journey of change. The story that unfolded depicted a man who, in his unwavering quest for fame and fortune, not only reshaped his career but also carefully constructed a public image to navigate the challenges of a prejudiced industry. Hollywood's glitz and glamour, it seemed, served as both a platform and a disguise for Grant, keeping the intricacies of his true self hidden. In a time when one's sexual orientation was closely guarded in the entertainment world, the details about Grant's alleged secret love nest and concealed identity added layers of mystery to his story. The charming leading man of the silver screen, it turns out, was not immune to the twists and turns of scandalous secrets and hidden affairs. There was such a pressure to conform to what was considered an ordinary, normal life. The documentary's noted Australian director Gillian Armstrong told Out Magazine, referring to Grant's four failed marriages to women. Ori refused to hide his sexuality with a fake marriage. He had such a great sense of personal integrity and we wanted to capture that sense of bravery in the film. For context, Kelly and Leach met just before Leach's 21st birthday in January 1925, as he, evicted for non-payment from a boarding house, sought refuge at Kelly's artist studio on 21 Commerce Street in the West Village. Leach, who would later assume the iconic moniker Cary Grant in 1931, arrived at Kelly's doorstep with a tin box cradling his meager possessions, a moment that marked the genesis of their unconventional partnership. As Kelly recalls in his memoir, the city at the time was a haven for bachelors, a sanctuary where men like Kelly and Leach could openly navigate their lives in ways unimaginable in their respective homelands. Leach, described by Kelly as devastatingly handsome, had traversed the Atlantic from England as a teenager, part of a stilt-walking troupe that set the stage for his American odyssey. His financial struggles saw him donning a worn suit as a paid escort, working as a carnival barker in Coney Island, all while aspiring to make his mark in vaudeville. In the midst of this tumultuous journey, Kelly, a mural painter for speakeasies with dreams of breaking into show business, forged a lucrative side hustle, handmade ties. Leach, ever resourceful, lent his hands to stencil designs, peddling the ties backstage at vaudeville houses, forging a partnership that extended beyond mere companionship. Their narrative took an unexpected turn when, a couple of years later, the duo ventured into the realm of running a speakeasy in Manhattan. Their entrepreneurial spirit didn't stop there. They tried their luck with a casino in Nevada, only to have their aspirations swiftly quashed by menacing gangsters who demanded hush money under threat of dire consequences. Kelly's memoir and the revelatory documentary, Women He's Undressed, unfold the tapestry of his tumultuous relationship with the man who would become Cary Grant. Though the 
documentary boldly asserts their romantic involvement, Kelly's account, while stopping short of explicitly labeling Leach as his boyfriend, paints a vivid portrait of a man whose heart experienced the tumultuous ebb and flow of love. An undercurrent of annoyance permeates Kelly's recollections, fueled by Leach's fixation on blonde women, despite always returning to Kelly. The pages of the memoir bear witness to Kelly's heartbreaks, intricately weaving a tale of a love that defied societal norms and flourished in the shadowy corners of vaudeville parties, where icons like Jack Benny, George Burns, and Gracie Allen mingled with the enigmatic Cary Grant. Yet, amid the swirl of passion and the transient highs of their shared endeavors, Kelly's memoir documents moments of discord, an incident where Archie knocked Kelly unconscious for three hours, triggered by a criticism of his vaudeville guest neglect, serves as a stark reminder of the complex dynamics that characterize their on and off relationship. The physical violence between the men was not uncommon between homosexual men of the period. Catherine Thompson, the documentary's writer, told The Post. A combination of self-loathing and confusion was manifested in a punch-up, or, on another occasion, Grant throwing Kelly out of a moving vehicle. As the calendar flipped to 1931, the saga of Cary Grant, formerly known as Archie Leach, and Ori Kelly continued in the glittering landscape of Hollywood. Grant, now under a lucrative $350 a week contract with Paramount, was swiftly ascending the ranks of Tinseltown's elite. Meanwhile, Kelly embarked on a remarkable 12-year stint as the head of the Warner Bros. costume department, leaving an indelible mark by crafting the iconic wardrobe for Ingrid Bergman in the timeless classic Casablanca. In the heart of Hollywood's glamour, the two men found themselves sharing living quarters once again, reveling in the simple pleasures of 65-cent drugstore dinners every night. Yet beneath the veneer of Hollywood's allure, cracks began to appear in their camaraderie. The newly anointed Cary Grant, now entangled in a whirlwind of fame and fortune, sparked heated disagreements with Kelly over his romantic entanglements. Complicating matters, Grant meticulously documented his expenses, presenting Kelly with a demand for reimbursement totaling $365, an amount covering meals and boxing match tickets, meticulously recorded in a little red book. Despite Kelly's willingness to settle the bills, tensions escalated, prompting Kelly to propose a somewhat unconventional solution. He suggested that Grant find new lodgings with the handsome young Paramount contractee, Randolph Scott. The enigmatic debate surrounding Grant's sexual orientation, whether he leaned toward being gay, bisexual, or heterosexual, intensified during this period. Central to this discourse was Grant's on-and-off cohabitation with Scott in a Malibu beach house, immortalized in a series of iconic photographs capturing them in seemingly domestic poses. However, the complexity of their relationship reached a poignant juncture when Grant, in 1934, exchanged vows with actress Virginia Cheryl. In a riveting revelation, the documentary discloses that Scott, unable to bear witness to Grant's marriage, attempted suicide, a tragic testament to the emotional turmoil underlying their connection. Following the dissolution of Grant's marriage in 1935, he and Scott found themselves sharing living quarters once more, rekindling a bond that seemed unbreakable. Their intertwined lives continued even after Scott's first marriage from 1936 to 1939 to a DuPont heiress came to an end. Intriguingly, Grant's 1942 application for U.S. citizenship listed him and Scott, signed as a witness, as residing at the same address. The intertwining of their lives extended beyond mere coincidence, raising questions about the nature of their connection. Around this pivotal period, Grant confronted challenges to his public image, particularly regarding his sexuality. Faced with insinuations from gossip columnist Hedda Hopper about his perceived lack of normalcy, Grant responded with a threat of legal action. The actor's resilience in protecting his privacy was further demonstrated in 1980, when he initiated a defamation suit against comedian Chevy Chase, who, in a jesting reference, labeled Grant as a homo. Chase was compelled to issue a retraction, underscoring Grant's unwavering commitment to shielding his personal life from public scrutiny. Grant and Kelly, meanwhile, had drifted apart. He was a Adjusting to the mask of Cary Grant, Kelly wrote, a mask that became his career, a career that became Grant. As the glittering facade of Hollywood's golden age unfolded, the intertwined destinies of Cary Grant and Ori Kelly took unexpected turns, marked by evolving personas, strained friendships, and the enduring mystery of concealed relationships. 
By 1931, Cary Grant signed a substantial $350 a week contract with Paramount. Simultaneously, Kelly embarked on a remarkable 12-year tenure as the head of the Warner Bros. costume department, leaving an indelible mark on the silver screen with his iconic designs for Ingrid Bergman's wardrobe in Casablanca. However, tensions escalated due to a growing number of disputes over the women in Grant's life after his rebranding. Coupled with the actor's insistence that Kelly repay him $365 for meals and boxing match tickets meticulously recorded in a little red book. Despite Kelly settling the bills, he proposed a resolution by recommending that Grant find alternative accommodations with the attractive young Paramount contractee, Randolph Scott. Cary Grant and Randolph Scott lived together off and on for nearly 12 years, sharing a Santa Monica beach house and a mansion in Los Angeles' Los Feliz neighborhood. But were the two living together as a gay couple in plain sight during the oppressive 1930s? Hollywood of that period was run by the infamous iron-fisted studio system, which monitored, managed, and practically dictated a star's personal and public life. Leading men like Grant and Scott would almost certainly not have been allowed to openly live homosexual lives, much less as a couple. Yet, rumors persisted about the two, and curiously, they both agreed to a photo spread in a fan magazine, which featured them as bachelors sharing a home together. The photos show them happy, laughing, working out, cooking. Picture perfect images of domestic bliss, if ever there was. In 1934, the studios ordered Grant to get married so as to kill the narrative about his sexuality. However, his wife, Virginia Cheryl, wound up divorcing him 13 months later, and Grant moved back in with Scott at the beach house. Stories of a variety of attractive young women going in and out of the beach house, dubbed Bachelor Hall, was said to be planted in the press by the studios. There were conflicting stories about the true nature of the duo's relationship. Their mutual friend, Carol Lombard, once jokingly referred to the pair as having the perfect relationship. Randy pays the bills and Carrie mails them. The fashion critic Richard Blackwell, of the infamous Mr. Blackwell's annual best and worst dress list, claims in his memoir that he lived for several months with the two and it was obvious they were quote-unquote deeply, madly in love, their devotion complete. Anyway, Kelly and Grant's paths converged once more in 1941 during the production of Arsenic and Old Lace at Warner Bros. However, the reunion was marred by tension, reflecting the strains that had surfaced in their relationship. Film historian William J. Mann recounts a poignant incident from that period in the documentary, revealing a palpable discord between the two. A seemingly innocuous event involving a limousine sent by the radio show Queen for a Day to the studio lot with its title emblazoned on the side became a source of contention. Grant, in what Mann describes as a real low blow, pointedly told Kelly, Ori, your limo has arrived. This exchange laid bare the complexities of their connection, tinged with a history of intimate personal involvement. Kelly's life, however, took a tumultuous turn fueled by personal demons. Struggling with alcoholism, he lost his job at Warner and found himself in rehabilitation. Despite this setback, Kelly orchestrated a remarkable comeback, earning Oscars for his costume designs in films like An American in Paris, Les Girls, and the iconic Some Like It Hot, where he crafted unforgettable dresses for Marilyn Monroe. In the late 1950s, Grant re-entered Kelly's life seeking to purchase paintings from the artist's studio as gifts. Kelly's memoir hints at a different motive behind Grant's visits, suggesting that the Hollywood legend was keen on dissuading Kelly from divulging details about their relationship. The documentary further proposes that Grant might have used his influence to obstruct the publication of Kelly's memoir. The manuscript, discovered in 2014 in an Australian relative's home, is now available only as an audiobook in the United States. Grant's unwavering stance on privacy is illuminated through Kelly's recollections. According to Kelly, Grant consistently urged him to divulge nothing, leaving Kelly perplexed about the need for secrecy. The narrative, shrouded in mystery and innuendo, invites speculation about the depth and nature of their connection. However, Kelly concludes his memoir with a revealing anecdote that casts a shadow over Grant's public image. During their final reunion in 1957, when Kelly was designing costumes for Auntie Mame starring Rosalind Russell, Grant's co-star in His Girl Friday, and a close friend, a lunch outing took an unexpected turn. After admiring Grant's Rolls Royce, the conversation shifted to Russell's upcoming trip to London. Grant, seemingly generous, offered the use of his roles for her journey, but dropped a surprising caveat. 
she should contact his agents for the rental fee and chauffeur costs upon arrival. This incident exposes a side of Grant that contrasts sharply with his suave on-screen persona, revealing instances where his old friends had been disappointed by his actions. Kelly quotes Russell's perspective on Grant, describing him as one who flits around hiding from his own shadow. Russell intimates that Grant fears exposure, concerned that his carefully constructed image might crumble in the light of scrutiny. Despite the intricacies of their relationship, Cary Grant, ever elusive about his personal life, never publicly acknowledged his connection with Ori Kelly. However, when Kelly succumbed to liver cancer in 1964, Grant defied the secrecy that had shrouded their friendship. Grant served as one of the pallbearers at Kelly's funeral, a poignant testament to the enduring bond that had weathered the highs and lows of their shared history. Grant, who retired from acting two years after Kelly's death, welcomed a new chapter in his personal life with the birth of his only child from his fourth marriage to actress Diane Cannon. Thirty years ago in November, Grant passed away, leaving behind an enigmatic legacy that continues to captivate Hollywood enthusiasts. Randolph Scott, whose second marriage endured 43 years and produced two children, died two months later. In any case, Grant's daughter, Jennifer Grant, wrote a memoir in 2011, in which she dismisses the notion he was gay and writes, Dad somewhat enjoyed being called gay. He said it made women want to prove the assertion wrong. Anyway, despite all the trouble he went through trying to conceal his sexuality, Grant definitely loved his career in Hollywood. You see, in the quaint streets of Bristol, England, a tale of resilience and reinvention began with the birth of Archibald Alexander Leach, a name that would one day be whispered in awe across Hollywood as Cary Grant. Born into an unhappy home, young Archibald's early years were shadowed by familial discord. The fragile facade of domestic bliss crumbled when, at the tender age of nine, his father made the heart-wrenching decision to institutionalize his mother. The echoes of familial tragedy reverberated through Archibald's childhood, casting a somber hue over his formative years. With his mother confined and his father remarrying, Archibald found himself abandoned to the care of the state, an orphan of circumstances navigating the tumultuous waters of adolescence. At the age of 14, expelled from school and harboring dreams beyond the confines of convention, Archibald took a decisive step into the world of entertainment. Joining a traveling stage troupe, he discovered a flair for stilt walking, a skill that mirrored his newfound ability to navigate the precarious heights of the entertainment industry. In 1920, at the remarkably young age of 16, he embarked on a transformative journey across the Atlantic with the troupe, bidding farewell to his native England and embracing the promise of the American dream. The American vaudeville circuit became Archibald's crucible, a testing ground for the talents that would define his entertainment career. With each performance, he honed his acrobatic, juggling, and miming skills. The St. Louis stage witnessed the metamorphosis of a young aspiring entertainer into a seasoned performer. The once awkward Archibald Leach emerged from the cocoon as the suave and sophisticated persona that would be immortalized as Cary Grant. As Hollywood beckoned, Archibald, now reborn as Cary Grant, signed a contract with Paramount. From the outset, he was cast as the embodiment of wealth and sophistication, yet success remained elusive. His first marriage to Virginia Cheryl ended in whispers of depression and disillusionment, casting shadows on the glitzy facade of Hollywood romance. However, a seismic shift occurred when Cary Grant embraced the comedic realm, setting the stage for a series of cinematic masterpieces. The Awful Truth with Irene Dunn became the harbinger of a new era, showcasing Grant's comedic genius and paving the way for classics like Holiday and His Girl Friday. His on-screen chemistry with leading ladies like Katharine Hepburn and Rosalind Russell elevated him to the pantheon of Hollywood legends. Amidst the celluloid triumphs, whispers of Grant's personal life swirled around his relationship with actor Randolph Scott. The duo's shared residence, aptly named Bachelor Hall, became a focal point for speculation about the nature of their connection. Grant's personal life, marked by marriages, divorces, and the enigma of his relationships, added layers of complexity to his public image. As the 1940s unfolded, Grant's career embraced diverse roles, from the suspenseful suspicion to the comedic I Was a Male War Bride. Collaborations with Alfred Hitchcock, who declared Grant the only actor he ever truly loved, further showcased his versatility. The intrigue of Grant's personal life continued, with his marriages and divorces creating headlines.
In the 1950s, Cary Grant remained a steadfast presence in Hollywood. Films like To Catch a Thief and North by Northwest, both directed by Hitchcock, captured the essence of his enduring appeal. The decline of quality films in Hollywood's landscape did little to dim Grant's star, as his films continued to resonate with audiences. The 1960s ushered in a new chapter as Grant embraced unconventional treatments including LSD therapy. His public endorsement of the psychedelic substance challenged societal norms, adding a layer of complexity to his image. Retiring from acting in 1966, Grant redirected his focus to fatherhood after the birth of his daughter. Grant's later years, marked by a blend of personal fulfillment and public recognition, solidified his status as a silver fox. The enigmatic aspects of his life, including rumors about his relationships with men, added layers of intrigue to his legacy. In 1970, he received an Oscar, a testament to his unique mastery of screen acting. When someone is described as Cary Grant-esque, it evokes a vivid image, one of impeccable style, social grace, and undeniable magnetism. The enigmatic facets of Grant's personal life, including rumors about his relationships with men, add layers of intrigue to his legacy. Cary Grant's journey from a troubled childhood to Hollywood stardom is a narrative of triumph over adversity, a testament to the enduring allure of a man who transcended the silver screen and left an indelible mark on the cultural landscape. As the curtains fell on Cary Grant's illustrious life, the legacy of a man who had lived multiple lifetimes within one persisted. His impact was not merely confined to the characters he portrayed on screen, but extended to the enigmatic persona he crafted off screen. The allure of Cary Grant transcended the constraints of time, leaving an indelible imprint on the pages of Hollywood history. Grant's journey from Archibald Leach to the epitome of Hollywood sophistication was a narrative of transformation and adaptation. It was a journey marked by the highs of success, the lows of personal struggles, and the nuanced interplay between the public and private realms. Anyway, that's it for this video, folks. Bye.